Hello, my name is Steve Elzey, and I'm the president of Your Sanctuary TV. Welcome to our show today. It's so nice to be here with the Your Town crew. Most of all, it's nice to be here with my guest, renowned artist, and an internationally renowned artist, Lucas Block. Lucas, welcome. Thank you. Good it, to be here. It is so nice to have you in the studio. You know, I, I, your personality is perfect for hey, television, hey, you know? Hey, hey. hey. And, and you and I, I mean, we grew up during the 60s, so yeah. we got that symbiosis going on, too. I, I don't I'm remember. not real sure what that means, folks. But yeah, I don't <laughs> remember much, but yeah. <laughs> do, do any of us. <laughs> Today, you and I have talked about doing this before. Right. But let me t explain to the audience. Today, we are going to talk about Lucas Block's paintings. And Lucas is going to explain them, and you will see them on the screen as he's explaining them. So, let's, are you ready? I'm ready, Okay, I never been readier? Uh, no. Okay, right. <laughs> we're in the Lucas Block <laughs> studio. That's it. And, and we're looking at a painting from 19, 1984. Yeah. The, uh, the year of Orwell. Yeah, 1984. Okay. And it's called Monochrome. Tell us about inspiration or anything you'd like to tell us about the painting. Well, I'm pretty much self-taught, so. Oh. Uh, you know, I went to a couple of uh, years of, college art classes, mm -hmm. but in making a living I didn't do a lot of painting for a couple of years, but then started painting again, and I started working with line work uh, and imagery. Mm -hmm. By 1984, uh, I had reduced it to just basically lines, mm -hmm. and because I had discovered, or not discovered, in learning and doing my own little journey in the paintings, mm -hmm. I started seeing how color was changing as I was putting them together. I mean, this is basic color theory, but at the 60s, mm -hmm. when they were teaching art in the 60s, they didn't teach anything about the techniques or this, the issues of what it takes to paint. Okay. So I didn't have that information. So as I was painting in my little studio, I started seeing things happening. Ah. And I kept focusing on that color. Mm -hmm. And that first painting that you have in the collection there from 1984 was pretty much reduced to the point of line work where okay. one color was enhancing another color. Oh so right. the painting kind of had an overall sheen or color happening, but it was not literally the color that was there, but it had sort of color in front of it, as it were. Uh, so it would sort of glow. And then things would change in little areas. As we moved through the paintings, what happened was I uh, got to the point where minimal became almost nothing. You know, the void became nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, and so I took the smaller areas and basically started blowing them up and getting the color to work as you look at the compositions mm -hmm. where the elements are much more obvious. Okay. So as you see the next paintings, you'll see how those things started developing. One question about this painting I have is why you called it monochrome because it seems, it appears at first to be a single, single color. Single color. Yeah, it appears okay. to be almost all the colors are very close. Right, right. okay. And, and which is uh, the beauty, one of the beauties of your work because I like so much about it is that when you look at the paintings, you need all of a sudden things start happening, yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. and then yeah. they come alive, so to speak. And it's always best to see them in person. Is that correct? Or yeah, that that's uh, one of the things that <laughs> that's always the discussion about painting. Is painting uh, important when we have film? We have film, we have film, we have photography, we right. have. Now we have conceptual art, we have things in three dimensions, sculpture, mm -hmm. uh, where does painting fit in all that? And, and there's kind of a strange thing. I still think paintings have their own power. Ah, okay. You know, there are people doing color work, for example, with lights and, right. and projections and so forth. And uh, that would have been a direction to go, but I really like the concept that a painting is a static position. Mm -hmm. But it's the viewer that makes it happen. Yes, yes, in the viewer's and eyes. Right. Not just the eyes. I mean, it, my particular work is about the, the eyes and the process of creating color that we do all that. Uh, but also with you know work that has a narrative to it. I mean, you're bringing what you understand from the piece. Right. And it's a static thing that you create. Okay. And so I'm really focusing on that in my work because it's just a very fundamental color experience. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a difficult thing to show people in photographs. Right. And I don't know what's happening on the TV screen when you project these images. Mm -hmm. uh, but 
the paintings have to be seen. Absolutely. And I think that's still a place where painting has a point. There's a, there's a separate experience that's unique to painting that I think is still relative. Well, since you, you now you are at that relevant. point, and I think it's a good point to actually skip ahead just a bit sure. to uh, what you what you have entitled Block Gurney, <laughs> which as as people see, there's a gurney, and but it's in front of one of your paintings, which are at. Community Hospital of the Monterey Peninsula, some right. of your paintings. Okay. And for me, seeing that was a wonderful experience because I was able to uh, uh, look at the, the work what, it, where it's hung. Right. And even that photograph makes the work completely different because it starts doing all kinds of things right. in the photograph. Yeah. And, and so uh, there, that was one instance. And, and t tell, tell me what you think is the, the, what happens, or is it an individual experience for people? Is that what, what, what you... I think, uh, philosophically speaking, yes, the reason sir. I can, you know, I, I spend a lot of time thinking. <laughs> I bet <laughs> trying you do. To, trying to do the paintings. Uh, and so I have to justify a lot of it for myself. But uh, generally, the, the thing that I'm fascinated by is, A, I'm married to a musician. Okay. A pianist. And uh, the idea that sound can become a lyrical experience where we actually feel an emotional context of something is something that I feel I'd like to try and do in the paintings. Okay. The thing is, in a painting, you have a static image. Right. But color is not static. Color is, is an experience. Mm-hmm. And we, do, we don't really see it anymore when we're older, but I think as children we see, as infants, I think we see that color activity all the time. One color creates the other color, vice versa. There's a relationship. It's not about, like for example, you have a blue shirt, right. but there's all kinds of colors going on in that blue shirt. Right. Our brains simplify it and say it's a blue shirt <laughs> because right. it would occupy too much of our time and too much of our brain power to be seeing all those things. Right. And what my paintings do is they force the brain again to see all the colors that we're generating. And in that, I think there's an introspection for, the, for, for me and a realization and an awareness of being in time and place now and having th that experience happening in a lyrical way. There's a sense of beauty, a sense of sometimes another emotional senses where you feel a sense of uh, confusion or, or discovery. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's happening because you, the viewer, mm -hmm. or me, the viewer, is creating the piece, okay. and I'm fascinated by that. I think, uh, as a as a meditation, as a as a as a, a reflection on your experience, as a as a sense of discovery about how you process and relating that to everything else in the world, that you realize you are the subject of your own life. Wow, you know, and that that's the basic underpinning. Okay, and it's been really fortunate because uh, I've found a wonderful uh, su support through the, c the community hospital that they've used my paintings in a healthcare situation. Yes. Because I think uh, they feel, and I, I, I'm pr of course promoted that way too, that, that there's, a, there's a, a good feedback loop that I think is really connected to the whole healthcare concept. Yes. Of healing yes. and being aware of your, your existence and your, your process. Beautifully put. Thank you, Lucas. How about the, a 1988 piece, Untitled? Um, tell us a little bit about that. Well, that's sort of the uh, transitionary phase from the first image that you saw from 1984. Okay. In 1987, my wife and I moved to Europe. Oh. And we were in London, and I had a studio there, and I painted, started painting pieces uh, uh, in England for an exhibit. Mm -hmm. And I was in the process of separating, as I mentioned, taking mm -hmm. those close areas of the monochromatic work and then yes. building them out. Okay. And uh, that is one of the pieces from that okay. period. Okay. And it, the piece is still in England now. But uh, Oh! And it's good because it's very gray there, so the color was happening. But uh, oh, boy. <laughs> but, you know, there's more uh, objects of chunks, and over the years I've tried to minimize that more. There's, there's more harmonious color happening later on, but that, that's what that piece was still at that phase. And then um, I, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about BECOM Block. Become is it Become Block? Beck, no, no. Beckham. No, this was an exhibit in 1999 at the Monterey Museum of Art. Okay. 
and uh, we shared the whole. I shared the whole the, the ex exhibition with Jeffrey Beckham. Oh, okay. I don't know if you're familiar with his work. He yes. He's renowned for his color photography. Okay. And his writings on color as it relates to cultures. Okay. He has a book on Mediterranean color, a mm -hmm. Maya color. Uh, his work is really related to uh, how people utilize color within their living environment, as well as the philosophical aspects of color. So anyway, I've known Jeff for many years, and we we always wanted to do an exhibit together. So we uh, he had an exhibit of his photo work. I had paintings, and there was a the Coburn Gallery. We decided let's do a color installation. Okay. So we we created a space architecturally that you could wander through okay. and every surface was painted a different color. Mm. So you were literally standing in the middle of all this color activity happening. Okay. And again, it wasn't done with light, it was all reflective color so that, it, the, again, we, the discussion was about how you dealt with it and how yes. you created it. Mm -hmm. So compositions happened as you walk through and things change as you walk through and you could stop and then <laughs> just let it happen. <laughs> It was wild. It was very well received. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, uh, I bet. It was I a bet. lot of fun to do. And and then there is another another piece. I, this is from that it's specific just look, installation. One, one is looking north and one is looking south. I'll be darned. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Now, I've got um, something here called 36 by 48. Yeah, that's just the size. There was, right. You know, I've sent you things just in sequence. I didn't really, I don't title my pieces, so they're right. usually just dated. Okay. But in this case, I just had the, you know, I, I pull it out of my file, don't have the date on it on mm -hmm. that particular file, but uh, it's just a glowing piece. It just radiates mm -hmm. red. And what what period was this in then? Uh, do you recall? Well, we're, we're moving sequentially after, right. after the exhibit at the at the Monterey Museum. The, so the pieces follow. Uh, okay, two thousands. Yeah, in the in the in the twenty first century. Ah, the twenty first century. Yeah. Um, the, and the following piece I yes. think that you're ready to point at is an is a nine foot tall painting that's actually ah. in the collection of the community hospital. Oh, okay. Uh, and it was hanging in at Chomp in uh, Monterey. Uh, it has now subsequently moved to Salinas. Oh, okay. In a <laughs> in one of their facilities. All right. And uh, it, it it was a good transition. Unfortunately, the design, which is based on paintings I've done before, in some ways, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> in in the art world, there's always that fear of whether you're imitating or not. But it turns out there's a guy named Peter Halley who who does color work as well. Okay. And I don't say it has any influence on me, but it turned out that some of the design I came in that with about a year later, a friend of mine brought me an article of Peter Halley's work and said, it looks just like yours. Oh, I'll be darned. So okay. that was a, a good signal to say, don't do that design again, or okay. don't work with that design. <laughs> My right. designs don't change that much always because it's the color I'm working on. Yeah. Yes. It's developing that radiance and improving. Yes. I mean, for me, it's still a search. I don't know what I'm doing, let's put it that right. way. I sort of l love the opportunity to... Uh, find the stuff that I'm looking for, but I'm not sure what it is, Okay. Uh, except I want it to be p more powerful, more connected to something fundamental. Mm, okay, the mystery of, yeah. of artistic experience. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. now this is just, this blows my mind, uh, the 55 by 110, 215, yeah. 13, a, a fairly recent painting. Yeah, 2013, yeah. Talk to us about uh, how, how this is put together and how big it is, 55 by 110? Yeah, I like working in large paintings if right. I can. I don't have a studio right now that I can do that, but at that time I was I was given the opportunity by Albert Paley, who has a studio in uh, Sand City. Okay. And uh, he said, do some large paintings. And I had an exhibit coming up in Los Angeles, which I wanted to have large paintings for, a great space. And uh, that particular painting is, is actually inspired by a painting that I did in Sand City Mm. That was the same size. Mm -hmm. However, that painting sold and went to New York. Okay. In New York, it was received. I handled the shipment to New York. Okay. But it was dropped off on the street, on 11th Street in the village in New York, to go into an eight-story apartment or flat. The owner of the painting was remodeling and had a contractor there and said, we'll take care of installing the painting. Okay. So I let it go. Okay. Two days after it arrived, I got a phone call from the owner saying, well, we took the painting out of the crate because it was too heavy for the winch in the crate, and we lifted up the building, <laughs> and there was a fire escape on the front of the building, and this painting bounced all the way up and was destroyed. Oh, my gosh. I'll be damned. So this is no longer existing? Or? Well, no, then 
because subsequently that that person asked me to do an, a, another piece, mm -hmm. which wasn't that one. It was actually done in sections so they could take it up through the okay, elevator. Okay, <laughs> right. Because <laughs> they didn't want to try that again. Mm -hmm. But I, I enjoyed the piece originally, and I thought, well, I want to do it again. I'm going, but so I I did that particular one that we have now. Okay. Which is uh, located, I believe, in somewhere in California. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Your your works are all over the country and all over the world, yeah. I would imagine. They are, I believe, Europe and Canada and right. the United States. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, I, I, if you if you wouldn't mind, could we talk a little bit about the four twenty five thirteen? It's uh, it's a big one too, fifty two by one thirty two. Uh -huh. It was mm -hmm. originally presented at the Monterey Museum of Art. It is. It is now at the Berkeley Art Museum. Oh my goodness! Uh -huh. And uh, it was a bit of a, a, a trip, as you, for me, in terms of I had. Uh, I had the show coming up for the museum. I was grateful to do that. That was mm -hmm. fun. But I was in a position at that time trying to figure out what I wanted to put in the show. I had the opportunity to sort of design the pieces for the exhibit, uh, and I kind of went backwards a little bit, oh. design-wise, mm -hmm. but. Color-wise, I went forward, which I, d I have a tendency to do that because I again the forms aren't so important as trying to develop the color and the get the relationships to work well. Mm -hmm. So in that particular piece, it's all yellows, canaries, you know. But, okay. Uh, the blues you see are are actually whites. Really. Mm -hmm. Even okay. in the, even in the small state and printed. Okay. Because they're white, your your brain is generating the blue. Okay. As a complementary to to the yellow. Okay, and I see that now. But, but also in that particular piece, which is a little harder to see in this scale or on the TV, I'm not sure. But in the actual painting, mm -hmm. those white squares generate yellow squ yellow or, or not squares, uh, rectangles generate yellow rectangles throughout the painting that keep moving and dancing. So you have a okay, yes, okay. So you have a composition of the yellow, which is, has its own glow. Mm -hmm. Then you have the white that's turning blue, which gives a sense of depth. And then all of a sudden you have this machine of, or what's machine-like movement of other rectangles happening and little colors popping up everywhere. So there's a piece that seems very simple and minimal, yet when you're with the piece, mm -hmm. it's doing all sorts of things. It actually traveled to Los Angeles for an exhibit, and uh, it was a lot of fun for people to stand in front of it, especially when they brought their kids in, which is really great. Oh. Because they had to define what part of it is the painting and what part of it is, is not the painting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that was a, dis a good discovery for a lot of the, the people seeing mm -hmm. it. It worked very successful in that regard, and it had a wonderful, uplifting feeling. The yellows were just. Yes. Uh, I think when I finished painting it, I mentioned to someone that it reminded me of uh, a piece of music that I'd heard once called oh. uh, uh, "Lark Ascending" mm -hmm. by Vaughn Williams. Okay. Because it had that sense of flying, and the color was just so vibrant. Right, right, and right. And the thing was just sort of fluttering. It was great. Okay, so I would. That was a pleasure for me to actually get to that point. Sure. Which, of course tells me, oh, gee, I should try and do that again. Well, you can't. Right. It's, that's very right. difficult. But the, form, but the forms kept going. And the, the following painting that you may show, the re there's a red version of it. But it works completely differently and has a completely different feel. OK. And, that's, and that right there is the red version? In a way, yeah. OK. It's, all right. But that's not specifically the red version. OK. Yeah. Well, f Lucas, I, I'm. Uh, I'm sorry, but we, we need to have you back because <laughs> yeah. we just have just barely touched the surface of your work. And uh, thank you for coming down. My pleasure. Really appreciate it. Will you come back and talk to of us course, sometime? Anytime. All anytime. right. Well, thank appreciate you so much. It. We're going to take a quick break right now, and we'll be right back.